It's the Maxwell Institute podcast. The Dead Sea Scrolls are unquestionably one of the greatest archaeological discoveries of the 20th century. Among the scrolls are the oldest biblical manuscripts ever found, dating from the crucial time of transition as Christianity emerged from Judaism. Renowned Old Testament scholar Dr. John J. Collins recently published a biography of the scrolls as part of Princeton University Press's Lives of Great Religious Books series. Dr. Collins joins us in this episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast to discuss what difference the scrolls have made to our understanding of ancient Judaism and early Christianity. An amazing discovery, political and religious controversy, academic squabbles, and intriguing possibilities. We'll talk all about the Dead Sea Scrolls in this episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast. John J. Collins, welcome to the Maxwell Institute podcast. Thanks for taking the time to talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls with us today. Very welcome. Now, your book stands out to me in the Lives of Great Religious Books series because it's not about a single great religious book. It's a collection of fragments and documents of some 900 or so manuscripts. And given the nature of the Princeton series, I'm interested to hear how you see your book differing from a biography of, say, the book of Genesis or the book of Job. Well, obviously, uh, it has it covers a much shorter period of time. And uh, in fact, I had uh, semi-facetiously suggested to Fred Appel at Princeton that we should call this the resurrected life of the Dead Sea Scrolls. <laughs> because, you know, were any other book written around that time, say, for example, the Epistle to the Romans, has been in circulation all that time and generating a response. This material was just buried in a cave and only came to light 70 years ago. So let's talk very broadly about what the Dead Sea Scrolls are. They've, they've been referred to as the greatest archaeological discovery of the 20th century. Before we unpack that claim, I think most people can at least agree that their discovery makes for a really fascinating story. So talk about what happened back in the 1940s. Well, what happened back in the 1940s, at least as the story is told, is that a few Arab shepherd boys were hunting their goats and uh, threw a stone into a cave and heard a bit of pottery cracking and so went in to explore and found these jars with scrolls. Whether that is in fact what happened, who knows? Uh, they may very well have been looking for buried treasure of one sort or another. But when they brought them in, then they took them to a cobbler in Bethlehem. And the reason they did that was because they were written on leather. And they thought a cobbler would be a good person to uh, <laughs> know about that. As it turned out, one very lucky cobbler at uh, the Candle family became quite wealthy, I think, on the basis of the scrolls. But he then became the main middleman. But now, what caused the initial stir when they looked at these was, first of all, you had a copy of the Book of Isaiah, nearly complete, that was a thousand years older than any known Hebrew copy of it before that time. And then you had a number of other uh, documents, including what looked like a rule for a religious community, and a commentary on a biblical text, and a paraphrase of a biblical text, and now, these were all in Hebrew, or in one case in Aramaic, and we had simply no literature in those languages from that time frame. Now, the book, the last books in the, the biblical tradition, uh, depending on your Bible, are the book of Daniel, uh, generally thought to be written about 164 BCE, partly in Aramaic, partly in Hebrew. And the book of Ben Sira, a little bit before that, written in Hebrew. But then after Ben Sira and Daniel, you, know, you have nothing until the Mishnah. Now, there was a lot of Jewish literature written in those years. It survived generally in translation. Uh, a lot of it in Greek, sometimes in secondary translations. But there was always a question about it. You know, is this authentic? This was material, by and large, that was preserved by Christians, not preserved by Jews. And so here now we had a trove of material from the Dark Ages of ancient Judaism, so to speak. And not only the Dark Ages, 
but precisely the period that saw the end of the temple, you know, the end of the Judean state and the rise of Christianity. Yeah, so it comes from a really critical time period, as you said. And what one thing that I thought was really interesting is how pretty f- quickly uh, Notice of the Dead Sea Scrolls wound up in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, what was what was that about? <laughs> but that was about uh, a Syrian archbishop, because now some of these scrolls ended up in different hands, and uh, some of them. Uh, were obtained early on by someone at the Hebrew University. But there was a Syrian archbishop who had a few of them. And he was not, he did not want to sell them to Israelis. This was also the time of the Israeli War of Independence, the partition of Palestine, however you view that. Now, the Syrian archbishop did not view it at all positively, naturally enough. Mm. And so he brought his scrolls to New York and put an ad in the Wall Street Journal. And then, uh, as it happened, a man named Yigel Yedin, a very famous, colorful character, uh, was in the States at the time, and he got a middleman to purchase the scrolls so that the Syrian archbishop didn't realize he was actually selling them to the Israelis. And so these scrolls ended up back in Jerusalem, where they can now be seen in the Shrine of the Book. And that's a kind of a neat looking building that was built, right? It looks sort of like the top of a scroll or something. Yes, or maybe like the top of a scroll jar. The jar, yeah. Or a kind of mushroom almost. Yeah. A very unusual looking building. So you yeah. know, you mentioned some of the political intrigue. Did that impact the type of scholars that were allowed to work on the scrolls early on? Absolutely. Uh, now, a number of them, as I say, came into Israeli hands very early on. Uh, the father of Yadin actually being one of the main movers in that, a man named Sukenik, and then the ones purchased by Yadin. So, in, in effect, the initial find from Qumran Cave 1 ended up in Israeli hands. But then the biggest find of scrolls came in 1952, and this was Cave 4. This was the biggest jigsaw puzzle ever found, you know, a hundred, several hundred manuscripts surviving only a little scraps. And uh, that material then was taken by the Jordanians, by the Jordanian Antiquities Authority. And they, understandably, in the circumstances, didn't want, not only did they not want any Israelis, they would not have any Jews working on these scrolls. And so the initial international team for the publication of the Dead Sea Scrolls didn't include any Jews. And that certainly did have an impact on how the history developed. Right, because I think depending on your background, uh, the type of questions that you bring to the scrolls are going to differ, right? That's absolutely right. Uh, The questions that interested the people who were actually working on the scrolls were largely the points of similarity to early Christianity. Questions about the Messiah, for example, and indeed questions about biblical interpretation. Uh, What they did not particularly get interested in were questions of religious law, what we call halakha. And that the classic example of that is a text known as 4QMMT, which I'm sure we'll come back to. which was identified in the mid-1950s and marked as 4Q proto mishnaic meaning this is stuff like what you get in the Mishnah. Explain the Mishnah really quick for people who don't know. The Mishnah is one of the classic rabbinic texts, and it's really a compendium of religious law based on biblical law, but interpreting it in detail and spelling out the different implications of it. Then the Talmud, which comes later, is a much more elaborate uh, document of basically the same type. And so in these these particular Dead Sea Scroll that you're mentioning, it it sort of was like a Mishnah type um, overview or discussion of Jewish legal issues? No, it was almost 30 years before that scroll was published. And when it got to be published, eventually, it was after some Israelis had been brought in on the discussion. And uh, then suddenly they realized, oh, this is important. (laughs) Because actually, at least as they interpreted, it included a statement. And it is because of these things that we have separated ourselves from the rest of the people. 
So this was actually giving you the raison d'etre of this group. But because it was concerned with what seemed to most Christians to be rather obscure matters of religious law, uh, nobody had paid any attention to it. So you mentioned earlier one of the one of the earliest scrolls that was found was was Isaiah. Now, that's obviously a very uh, popular and well known book from the Hebrew Bible, uh, and I, I believe every book from the Hebrew Bible was present except for Esther. Is that right? That is right. Uh, now you might debate Nehemiah. Uh, now, a fragment of Nehemiah turned up about ten years ago, and it's not too sure just where it came from. Hmm. Presumably, it came from somewhere in the, the same corpus. Now, and of course, Nehemiah was not always, uh, it was often thought to be one book with Ezra. So if you had a fragment of Ezra, that would do for Nehemiah too, so to speak. Uh, and you have very tiny scraps of, of, of chronicles, for example. Hmm. Now, how about non-canonical books? Did they, did they find non-canonical books there? They, they found lots of them, and uh, right, this came came to prominence early on. Fragments of the books of Enoch and the book of Jubilees, and there are a lot more copies of Enoch and Jubilees than there are of books like Ezra and Chronicles. So it seems like they probably maybe played a bigger role for this particular group. That, that seems likely, yeah. How about more of the, of the sectarian books you mentioned? Are these the rule books you were mentioning earlier? Um, how about the Manual of Discipline or the Community Rule? Yeah, the text that was identified by Miller Burroughs as a Manual of Discipline, uh, or it is now more commonly called the Community Rule or by its Hebrew name, Serika Yachad, is a rule for a religious community. Now, uh, this... Uh, you know, it gets into a lot of details, you know, things that you may not do if you if you aren't dressed properly at an assembly. What's the penalty if somebody lies down and falls asleep in the midst of the assembly? <laughs> there's a penalty. If somebody guffaws loudly, there is a penalty for that, too. <laughs> so this is all, you know, community regulation in a quite minute way. That's at the heart of it. Now, it turns out, actually, there were at least two different rules. There's also the one that we call the Damascus document. This one actually, a copy of it had been found, or two copies of it had been found in the Cairo Genidza uh, from the Middle Ages. And these had come to light at the end of the 19th century. Now, the difference is that in the Damascus document, they talk about people who marry and have children. Hmm. And in the community rule, they never mention women or children. Why is that? Well, most people think that it's because the community rule was written for a celibate community. This gets us on to the question of the Essenes, because the Essenes, who have a lot in common with these people, were supposed to be celibate. Although the Jewish historian Josephus tells us that there was also a branch of them that married, so they weren't all celibate. But the oddity in the case of the community rule is that they don't say and those who enter this community shall not marry. Now, some people would argue, reasonably enough, that if you don't want people to marry, that's something you need to tell them explicitly. But on the other hand, this is a text that's obsessed with questions of purity. Now, there is nothing that gives rise to impurity faster than sex. Right. So <laughs> the idea that they wouldn't even mention the topic is very odd. Hmm. It was it, written for a celibate community, but I'll grant you it's a debatable issue. Right. The, the Essenes, they've been a particular point of interest. They're the, uh, thought to be the people who are responsible for this large collection of writings, uh, a Jewish sect that was far removed from rabbinic Judaism uh, and, and maybe even resembled Christianity in some ways. Your chapter in the book on the Essenes zeroes in on an interesting component of the discussion. You talk about the underlying motives in the scholarly debates about who the Essenes were. Uh, I'd, I'd like to hear you talk about some of those motives in in the scholarship. Well, you know, let's uh, let's start with the with who the Essenes were, or what do we know about them? Right. We have an account by the Jewish philosopher Philo, who lived about the time of Christ. 
And he describes them, he calls them Essenes, and uh, describes them as a rather monastic type of community and says that they were celibate and they had common property was an important thing. Priests played an important role in it. They were obviously concerned about purity. Now, Josephus, Jewish historian, writing at the end of the first century, gives a much more elaborate account. And I think it is reasonable to infer that both Philo and Josephus were using or were drawing on accounts that had been composed by other people. And these were written, these would be what we would call uh, Hellenistic ethnographic accounts, because it was popular in the Greek or Roman world to write accounts of strange people that you came across in your travels. And they talk about the Essenes this way. The third important account was by Pliny the Elder, a Jewish naturalist who died in the, uh, the eruption of Mount Vesuvius because he was curious and he got too close. And he talks about the Essenes and it isn't even clear that he knew that they were Jews. He seems to think of them as a, as a distinct people. Now, the main things that strike you in these accounts is that you know, they live as a community, according to Pliny, they live without any money and without any women. A neat trick. And he says it's a <laughs> thing that even though nobody is born into this community, it continues on for thousands of years, which was surely a wild exaggeration. But it was a form, they, they had a lifestyle that was rather similar to what you get in Christian monasteries a couple of hundred years later. And that was the really intriguing thing about it, I think. So, Back, you know, people always knew about these accounts. Actually, some people in the early church figured these Essenes must have been Christian. And maybe they say that, or that they had become Christian and uh, that they had met up with the apostle Mark when he went to Alexandria. What el what made so, them think they were Christian? Were they like doing Christian. baptisms or what sort of things were they well, doing that seemed so Christian? They had ritual washings. But it was mainly that they had their common property and were celibate. Mm. Those, I think, were the, and a strong belief in an afterlife. Okay. Now, you get a belief in an afterlife also in Jewish texts. Uh, the, the cliche is that in Judaism, you get resurrection of the body. In the, with the Essenes, it's very much uh, immortality of the soul mm. is the way that it's put. So, you know, things vacillated then over the centuries, as I wrote uh, in the book, for a long time, people looked on them as early Christians. And then at some point in the, the Renaissance, people said, no, no, this can't be, they couldn't be Christians, they must in fact be, uh, be Jews. But then you get the debate about them is, if they're Jews, are they, so to speak, real Jews? And there's a famous scholar who said that they are Pharisees in the superlative. <laughs> and actually, this is a pretty good insight because he realized that they were very much concerned with the laws of Leviticus and that that was really a driving force in them. Then, on the other hand, uh, Ernst Renan, a great French scholar, said that uh, Christianity was an Essenism that succeeded. So emphasizing the other side of the poll, the things they had in common with the early Christians. And then you get a reaction among Jewish scholars where some of them tend to disown the Essenes and say those aren't real Jews. And then others, you know, who embrace them and uh, say this was part of the fabric of Judaism at the time. The main thing about them is though that they're different on the whole, or at least they have some things about them that are quite different from what you get in the rabbinic literature or what we would associate with the Pharisees. So what kind of scholarly motives came to play as, as people were looking at these? Was it kind of like Christians were, as you said, emphasizing the, the Christian elements, and you had Jewish scholars emphasizing the Jewish elements, and, and that was sort of impacting their interpretations of, of the data? In the 50s and 60s, there were very few Jewish scholars working on the scrolls, or they were mainly working on the scrolls that, uh, that had fallen into Jewish hands early on. And uh, the Christian scholars tended to produce volumes on the scrolls and Christianity 
There are collections of essays still in print on that kind of topic. And they looked for analogies, not only to the Messiah, but also to the community organization, to the, the, uh, you know, the, the book of Acts, it says that the early Christians had all things in common. And this would be one of the few analogies, at least outside of the Greek world, for shared possessions. This is a, a quite an unusual kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, that was where the, the thrust of most of the Christian scholarship went in the 50s and 60s. Things began to change with the 1967 war, because then Yadin, the colorful character that I mentioned already, was by then a general in the Israeli army. And he had heard that Kando still had scrolls that he was keeping under his floorboards. So he took some soldiers and paid a visit to Kando and hmm. took up the floorboards and came away with a big scroll that's known as the Temple Scroll the longest of all the scrolls found in the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, a lot of it is about the ideal temple, but a lot of it is about the laws of Deuteronomy and Leviticus and trying to harmonize them and blend them into a, a smoother presentation. Now, when that then came to light, this aroused great interest in what you'd call the legal or halakhic aspects of the scrolls. And people began to notice, actually, you get a lot of this stuff in the Damascus document already. And so you had a new phase of scholarship then taking off in the early 80s. Then this 4Q MMT came to light, this text that I mentioned already, that was kind of a proto mishnaic And I'd say from that time on, you've had an awful lot more Jewish scholars. And the Jewish scholars, again, with exceptions, tend to be more interested in the kind of thing you also get in rabbinic literature. So it's partly the legal or halakhic literature and partly the midrash or the midrashic techniques. That's Dr. John J. Collins. He's the Holmes Professor of Old Testament Criticism and Interpretation at Yale University, author of a biography about the Dead Sea Scrolls. In the middle of all these scholarly debates and puzzles, uh, Dr. Collins, we have a number of variables at play. You have a number of texts that are being interpreted. We have archaeological sites that are being excavated. And you have different scholars who are bringing different backgrounds and tools and perspectives to bear on all of these things. Uh, I, I presume you've been to this site. I know you've briefly examined some of the actual scrolls. Can you talk about how interpretation of geography and uh, of geography has affected interpretation of these texts? Uh, yeah, I think it is probably the case that the interpretation of the text has interpreted the, uh, has influenced the interpretation of the site more than vice versa. Hmm. Because, you know, archaeology uh, doesn't really tell you anything unless you have a story to go with it. That's the problem. Hmm. You, know, you dig up items out of the ground. Now, you've got to fit them into some kind of a narrative. And you don't dig up the narrative. Now, in the case of Qumran, it was a couple of years before it occurred to people that this ruin, uh, about a kilometer from where the first scrolls were found, but very close to Cave 4, uh, that that ruin was actually like, the community where these things were kept. And so then the, the uh, excavation was conducted by a Dominican priest named Roland de Vaux. And he's often now been criticized for imposing a kind of monastic model on the site. But in all fairness to him, this was not an unreasonable thing to do, because the, the texts were already suggesting uh, a monastic kind of interpretation. And then the site lent itself to it remarkably well. You see, it's out in the middle of nowhere on the shore of the Dead Sea. It isn't, in spite of attempts to make it into a military fort, it isn't really strong enough. It couldn't be fortified well enough to be a significant military fort. Now, I'll come back to that point, because it might have had a military use at some point mm -hmm. in its history. But the main problem that you have, if you're going to have, uh, if you're going to live down by the Dead Sea, is water. And so they have a remarkable system for collecting rainwater, uh, there was a spring nearby, but not actually on the site. 
but they collected the rainwater and channeled it into all these pools, and they have something like 11 big pools uh, that are found on the site. And so his hypothesis, and it's the one that's still most widely held, was that this was a religious community, that they needed all this water not only for drinking, but also because they were obsessed with washing. And uh, that, that that's why the, the community was set up in that way. But the interpretation of that really stands or falls on the interpretation of all the pools. And the fact that all of these pools are stepped pools, 10 or 11 of them, uh, lent itself to the hypothesis that they were for immersion. And at least in one case, there was a divider in the steps to separate people coming, going down from people coming up. And that, again, would lend itself to that interpretation. So that's the, the, the dominant interpretation. Now, every now and then somebody comes along with a new interpretation. I just read last week of the death of a relatively young Israeli archaeologist. He died in an accident on a site. Uh, but he had been one of two people who suggested that the whole thing was a pottery factory. Hmm. Now, you know, I think that is pretty much nuts. Out in the middle of nowhere. In the middle of nowhere. And uh, Jody Magnus, who's a, a very articulate archaeologist, uh, commented, you know, uh, can you imagine transporting pottery? You're making pottery down by the Dead Sea to ship it up to Jerusalem on the backs of donkeys. How much of it is going to get there in one piece? <laughs> the, the real estate was probably cheap out there, though. Yeah. So, At another time, people suggested that it was a luxury villa. And this, again, was sheer nuts. Because who in their right mind, if they had enough resources to build a luxury villa, would want to do it by down in the, the driest place on earth? With a bunch of religious texts. So, yes, with the, indeed, with a bunch of religious texts. Now, you see, the people who, who want to say that it was something other than a religious community uh, will say that the texts just happened to be hid there, hidden there hmm. and that the texts were brought from Jerusalem at the time of the Jewish war and hidden in this area and had nothing whatever to do with the site. Now, I think there is a small element of truth in that because not all the texts that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls could possibly have been written at the site. And I think it kind of beggars belief to think that there was a library with a thousand texts in a godforsaken place like that. Yeah, that's a big, sizable library for the, for the era, right? It's a very sizable library for the era. You know, this wasn't Alexandria. Uh, and most temple libraries had, you know, maybe 20 books. 20 scrolls or something like that, here you have 900. And you also have multiple copies of things like the community rule. And so I think, while I think there was indeed some library on the site, uh, I think it was the other Essenes who brought these texts from all over the country at the time of the crisis when the, the Roman army was advancing. Was there a uh, scriptorium found on the site? Was there a, a scriptorium where they could see where people were doing copying? This is very controversial. Uh, you know, DeVos supposed that there was. And he supposed that this was an upper room that had then collapsed. Mm. The evidence that it was a scriptorium was three or four inkwells. Mm. Now, how impressed you're going to be by three or four inkwells depends on your temperament. Do you think a glass is half empty or is half full? So, you know, there are people who will say it's only three or four inkwells. Three inkwells do not a scriptoria make. But then you hardly ever find any inkwells. Oh. So it's quite remarkable because they were metal, and this is the kind of thing that would get picked up okay. over the years. So take your pick. <laughs> yeah, that's the hard part, right? It's, it's A lot of this comes down to take your pick. But do we have actual evidence of it? No, we don't. You can see photos of a reconstructed uh, scriptorium with the... Uh, these people writing on tables, but it's often pointed out scribes in antiquity tended not to write on tables. They squatted and had tablets on their on their lap. And so, no, we don't really know. I think it's likely that there were some scribes there who copied some texts, but certainly not the whole thing. Okay. Next, I, I want to explore a little bit more detail about 
Christianity and Christianity's relationship to these scrolls. And this is one of your chapters covers this. Um, in the fourth chapter, you observed that a lot of people were excited by the similarities between the scrolls and the New Testament. And you've mentioned a few things uh, along the way here, but let's look a little closer. For some scholars, this suggested that Christianity wasn't unique, like you said, that, that it was just successful Essenism, basically, that, that it was merely derivative. Christianity's not so great. Here we have proto-Christians who are kind of doing their own thing, and other scholars saw this continuity as evidence that Christianity legitimately fulfilled or grew out of Judaism. What are your thoughts on these types of responses to the data? Well, first of all, let's talk a little bit about what the similarities and the differences are. Uh, there are you know, hundreds of interesting parallels to the New Testament that you can find in the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. I mentioned one or two of them. There is an Aramaic text that says of somebody, son of God, he will be called, and son of the Most High, they will name him. This is the Aramaic equivalent of a passage in the Gospel of Luke. Now, if this were from a biblical text, nobody would doubt that Luke was citing it. Everybody is a bit nervous about supposing that Luke was citing a text that we didn't know of at all until the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Uh, there is another one that talks, it says, heaven and earth will obey his Messiah, and then talks about the wonderful things that the Lord will do, as he said, he will heal the sick, raise the dead. And this reads just like a passage in Matthew chapter 11. But there are hundreds of details like that. The reason for this is these people were all Jews living in a small area Use, reading the same texts and with many of the same ideas, many of the same idioms. On the other hand, there is another side of the scrolls, and this is the halakhic side. That, and that this is the stuff that came to the fore now with 4QMMT. One my favorite example of the, the kind of issue that caused these people to separate from other Jews was it's all about purity. And one of them was the purity of liquid streams. If you pour water from a, one glass into a second glass and the second one is dirty, does the impurity travel upstream? Now, I had never in my life worried about that. <laughs> On the other hand, I have a son who's a scientist and he tells me he worries about that kind of thing all the time. Yeah, right. Maybe, maybe they were on to something. But, you know, this was... Uh, Utterly an unchristian <laughs> preoccupation. No, Jesus, we're told, said that it isn't what goes into a man that makes him impure, it's what comes out of it. Right. But these people believe that what goes into a man can make him impure. And so, you know, at, at a fundamental level, these were on the opposite end of the spectrum from the early Christians. So, what bearing does it have, you know, on the authenticity of Christianity? Well, I mean, it does lend support to the view that a lot of the ideas and idioms that you get in the New Testament are indeed representative of Judaism in the first century. Does it make it mean that the New Testament interpretation of Judaism is right? Not necessarily. It doesn't really have any bearing on that. So, you know, it does lend some confirmation to the historical authenticity of some of the New Testament. Uh, now, does it affect the originality? Not really, because everybody knows that an awful lot of what you have in the New Testament is an interpretation of the Old Testament anyway. And the distinctive things that you get in the New Testament, which are the claims made about Jesus, those you do not get in the scrolls. So, you know, it's not going to change anybody's belief in the end of the day, but uh, you can get an awful lot of interesting details that you can now color in. So is that kind of what your advice would be then to Christians uh, who come to the Dead Sea Scrolls <laughs> yeah. in terms of what they can get out of them, what use they are to Christians? Yeah, they, sh they should think context. In your it's not proof of anything one way or the other. It's just richer context, better understanding. And context, that, that can be tricky, right? Because when you 
clue. For example, popular media outlets. When when popular media outlets get involved in Dead Sea Scrolls stories, uh, and this you show this in different places in the book, like Time Magazine, the New York Times. From what you've seen, has it been difficult, do you think, for journalists to translate the work of scholars into a journalist's format? <laughs> Most journalists, in my experience, have no interest in translating the work of scholars. <laughs> they just want a headline. You know, I remember when I taught at the University of Chicago, uh, they, there was some story about dinosaurs. And this guy called me up and said, oh, could we relate this to the flood? <laughs> but only, you know, it was completely manufactured. He didn't care. He just wanted to have a story. He was supposed to write religious stories. He didn't care how he manufactured them. The more preposterous they were, the better. <laughs> so, now, I mean, you will find a few journalists who actually know enough about the subject and are interested in doing it intelligently. An awful lot of them aren't. What do you suggest then for people who aren't directly? There's, there's no offense meant here. <laughs> yeah, no, no offense. What, I'm uh... to you about the elite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what sort of suggestions would you give then to people who aren't aren't really plugged into the, you know, to the research that's ongoing? They encounter discussions about the scrolls in the news. What kind of uh, resources or tools are available for them to maybe be more discerning with some of the media representations of what's going on in the research? Oh, you know, I think there are some readable books out there that they can read. I would even hope that this is one of them. (laughs) And uh, that there is a nice one also by uh, James Vanderkam, who teaches at Notre Dame, called The Dead Sea Scrolls Today, written in a very simple style, but quite reliable, you know. So I think... uh, you know, the, the, uh, as with anything else, obviously, you can't believe everything you read in the newspapers and you don't really arrive at understanding of anything without putting a little sweat into it and doing a little bit of homework, which is actually easier to do nowadays. If you Google the Dead Sea Scrolls and Wikipedia, you, what you find won't be too bad. Okay, good. Um, so we talked about Christianity here. Let's yeah. let's look at Judaism. Your chapter in the book on Judaism is where you really dig into the idea of apocalyptic writing, apocalyptic perspectives. What What is that uh, all about? Okay, by apocalyptic writings, we mean the idea that people get revelations about the heavenly world and the nether world and the end of this world and a final judgment. Now, that kind of thing is crucial to early Christianity. It's crucial to the New Testament. And there was certainly a certain amount of it current in Judaism around the turn of the era. Now, the debate has been how typical of ancient Judaism was that. A lot of these apocalyptic writings, like the books of Enoch, were preserved by Christians and weren't preserved by Jews at all. When a lot of these came to light in the 19th century, and then around 100 years ago, a couple of scholars tried to put all that together and paint a picture of Judaism that was mainly based on things like the books of Enoch. Now, some of the rabbis reacted very negatively to that and said, no, this is marginal stuff that we didn't even preserve. If you want to know about Judaism, you read the Mishnah and the Talmud. These are the traditional rabbinic writings. Everybody knows those books were compiled a couple of hundred years later. But the idea was that they preserved the oral tradition. Now, with the Dead Sea Scrolls, you got the possibility of checking. And actually, what the Dead Sea Scrolls have shown is that both sides were partially right. Because a lot of what you get in the rabbinic literature, you can see the beginnings of that in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But also there is a whole apocalyptic side. There is a, a scroll called The War of the Sons of Light Against the Sons of Darkness, which is essentially directions for how you should line up for the final battle. This is great apocalyptic stuff. You have a very strong expectation of an afterlife and not so much of a one big resurrection, but the idea that people are judged and rewarded and punished after death. That's all over the place. Uh, In the community rule, you have the idea that the world is divided between two spirits, light and darkness, and that it's a struggle between these two. Now, these are ideas that survive much more strongly in 
Christianity than they did in rabbinic Judaism. So, yes, you know, Judaism in the period of the scrolls, and, you know, none of these scrolls is later than, than the middle of the first century of the Common Era. So what we're talking about is the last century before Christ and the first century afterwards. And in that period, Judaism was much more diverse than it became in some places later on. Uh, but you did already have the rabbinic side of things, but you also had the apocalyptic side. And so you can uh, you can claim some truth for both sides of the argument. Why do you think the apocalyptic sort of faded out in Judaism over time? And in Christianity, it seemed to have a little bit more staying power. You know, in part, I think it was because it became associated with Christianity that it faded out in Judaism. The reason that is often given is that at the end of the first century, you had a big Jewish revolt against Rome, and then you had another one in the early second century. Now, the apocalyptic books were telling people that when it came, when push came to shove, God would send his angels to deliver his chosen people. And they didn't show up. Mm. And I think people were disillusioned with that kind of apocalyptic idea and with messianic expectation for the same reason. And a number of the rabbis said, forget about that stuff. Keep the law, study the law, keep your eyes on the ground and don't worry about these these long-term speculations. Let's talk about some of those Jewish messianic expectations, because that also kind of bears on, on the Christianity angle as well. What sort of expectations did they have for a Messiah? Actually, you know, there are a number of different ideas, because in the scrolls they talk about not only a, a royal Messiah, but also a priestly Messiah. And in a couple of cases, a prophetic Messiah. And in some cases, you even have a heavenly Messiah. But there was a standard description. If you talked about the Messiah without further qualification, what you were looking for was somebody who would restore the kingdom of David, drive out the foreigners, mainly the Romans in that period. In order to do that, he must be a mighty warrior. He could slay the wicked with the breath of his lips. It doesn't have to be with his arm, but he does have to slay them. So he's a violent figure and somebody who is to clear out the infidel and pave the way for the restoration of the proper Jewish cult. That's your standard issue description for the Messiah. It's based on a number of passages in the Hebrew Bible. Balaam's oracle about the scepter and the star is a classic one where he's supposed to smash heads. So it no, seems like Christianity had an uphill battle then. I mean, they, they had a yeah. Messiah who obviously didn't. Um, yeah, and it, you figure if that was the job description, why would Jesus even apply? Yeah, right. Now, uh, I think there are some of the, the sub-traditions in the scrolls throw some light on that. When you look, for example, at the, there is this text that talks about heaven and earth will obey his Messiah, and I take that to be talking about uh, a messianic figure who is more like Elijah. Now, that's much closer, actually, to what you get in the, in the Gospels. And I think what happens with Jesus is he goes around talking about the kingdom of God is at hand, and his followers get excited, and they figure if he's saying the kingdom of God is at hand, he must be the one who is going to bring it. Mm. And now that leads to some confusion of expectations. And then you have the story of the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, and then, then this leads to his crucifixion. The Romans had a formula for how you deal with people like that. Yeah. So now, you know, whatever was going on in Jesus' head is a much more difficult question to get at. But I think it's not so difficult to see how the perceptions arose. And then after he was crucified, what happens in the case of Jesus is that they say, well, he mustn't have been that kind of messiah. Let's go back to the scriptures and see if we can get another job description for which he'd be better qualified. And that's where you get, you go back to one coming on the clouds of heaven, like the Son of Man in the, the book of Daniel, and that kind of thing. So what else have scholars of Judaism been doing with the scrolls um, more recently? 
More recently, there's been an awful lot on the continuities between the scrolls and rabbinic Judaism. I would say that's probably the growth industry. Because for a time, they were trying to really sort of separate those, weren't they, saying that this was an outlying... Yeah, but I think the the tendency... I mean, even people who might still say they were very different, but still, it's the comparison that interests them. Now, I mean, there's a whole range of other topics then that uh, that you can get into as well. But I would say you know, there's probably been less interest in recent years in the underlying history, although that is a great interest of my own. Well, it seems to be the hardest thing to nail down, though. I mean, as you were talking about earlier, you got to, you look at the data and you kind of take your pick. Well, it's hard to nail down because they don't name names and they don't they're, they're, they don't tell a story. Now, you know, it's quite clear that they had this movement. There was a figure in that movement that they refer to as the righteous teacher. That's all they call him. They don't tell you his name. And then anything they say about him is going to be draped in biblical allusions, which makes it doubly hard to figure out what was going on. And he had a nemesis too, right? And he had a nemesis, the wicked priest. Now, uh, I think, you know, the best clue to that is when you ask why was it that this group separated from the rest of Judaism? And that turns out to be because of purity issues, because of the interpretation of the religious law. And so one can safely enough conclude that's the kind of thing this righteous teacher was doing. Uh, this text for QMMT that I mentioned a couple of times uh, was initially dubbed the letter of the teacher of righteousness to the wicked priest, because it seems to be an appeal to a high priest or a ruler in Israel to accept the sectarian interpretation of the law. And they didn't. Now, we know, in fact, there was a shift in the about 75 BC. It was a, this was in the time of the Hasmoneans, the successors of the Maccabees. And a king named Alexander Janaeus had ruled for about 25 years. And when he was dying, he, all the time that he lived, he was at war with the Pharisees. He did not see eye to eye with the Pharisees at all. But he, when he was dying, he told his widow, make peace with the Pharisees. It isn't worth it. And so she did. And she appointed one of their sons, Hyrcanus II, as high priest. And he adopted the Pharisaic interpretation of the law. I think that was the dispute with the wicked priest, mm. that the Essene leader wanted him to adopt the Essene interpretation, and that, to a great degree, agreed with the interpretation of the Sadducees. Some that, people, the fact that he didn't, that's what made him the wicked priest. Some people have tried to connect the, the great teacher uh, with Jesus or with John the Baptist. What kind of things uh, suggest that that connection isn't likely? Well, because the teacher is obsessed with purity. You know, he's, he's a, a community man. That he's doing is setting up a hierarchical community where everybody bows when they meet somebody older than them and everybody behaves with proper deference. John the Baptist wouldn't have lasted a week. <laughs> in that. I think he'd have been out on his ear, and Jesus too, probably. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that this was not their mindset at all. They were really coming from the other end of the spectrum. So it's almost like the Essenes are sort of like super Pharisees. They're like, that's yes. sorry, the Pharisees aren't doing good enough, so we need yeah, to... <laughs> this was the phrase of Emil Schurer, a great German scholar a hundred years ago. There's also something, though, about the Pharisees <laughs> where uh, I think a lot of uh, Christians take their views of the Pharisees uh, just from the New Testament, right? And the New Testament is very um, aggressive in denouncing the Pharisees. And some Jewish scholars have pushed back a little bit to say that the view of the Pharisees as presented there uh, reflects some difficult relationships between Christians and Jews. Yeah. And the Pharisees weren't necessarily this terrible group of people who were crazy religious zealots. Uh, what, how would you nuance uh, Pharisees as a historical well, movement? Uh, you know, when you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, now admittedly the Dead Sea Scrolls doesn't call them Pharisees, but it calls the group of people called the seekers after smooth things. Oh. And most, most of us think those, in fact, were the Pharisees. Now, calling them seekers after smooth things tells you already something. 
They're saying, these are softies. They're wimps. They're not giving you the real hard stuff. They're compromisers. Now, of course, that isn't at all the way the early Christians saw them. Right. So, but if you line these up, the Pharisees were likely to be the people in the middle. Were they religious zealots to some degree? And probably some of them were, but not nearly as much as the Essenes. You know, these were relatively moderate people, people who wanted to observe the law in all its details, but do it reasonably. And why did they want to? Because the idea is that Pharisees, and the word itself has just come to denote a, hip, yeah. a hypocrite, right? So, but Pharisees themselves, why did, why were they desiring to be so scrupulous about the law? You know, actually, it means, what the word means is separatists, because they were particular about who they would eat with. They wouldn't eat with certain people if they weren't observing the purity laws, right? So, you know, in that sense, they, they had the same impulse as the Essenes. They were both concerned to observe the laws very strictly. But the Essenes had a stricter interpretation of it. The Pharisees were a little bit more reasonable. And you can see this. I mean, you know, that they they can say if you have a rule that somebody is supposed to fast on the, the Day of Atonement. But if somebody is in his 80s and toddling around, you know, you don't insist on that. Right. Whereas I think the Essenes would have said, right on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a really interesting distinction there. I mean, you have, you mentioned the Pharisees occupying a sort of middle ground. I'm speaking with Dr. John Collins. He's the author of the Dead Sea Scrolls, a biography from Princeton's Lives of Great Religious Book series. We'll take a short break and be right back with the conclusion of this episode. Sam Brown was a teenaged atheist, struggling to get firmer footing. On an August Sunday morning in 1990, he found himself sitting at the sacrament table in an LDS chapel next to his brother and two close friends preparing to utter a prayer over the water. What brought him back? How did he go on to write a sympathetic, scholarly book on Joseph Smith and early Mormon theology? And how did his research shape his faith? Find out in the Maxwell Institute's new book, First Principles and Ordinances, The Fourth Article of Faith in Light of the Temple. Following on the heels of Adam Miller's Letters to a Young Mormon, Sam Brown's book is the latest in the Institute's Living Faith series, books aimed at spiritual and intellectual inspiration. You can find First Principles and Ordinances by Samuel M. Brown at maxwellinstitute.byu.edu or on amazon.com. Dr. John Collins joins us today. He's the author of the Dead Sea Scrolls, a biography from Princeton's Lives of Great Religious Books series. Dr. Collins, in your introduction, you point out that your biography of the scrolls speaks to the present day ethos of the scholarly community. What did you have in mind here? Well, um, you know, the whole experience of working on the Dead Sea Scrolls in, say, the last 30 years has been an interesting ride. And uh, the reason for it was that some people realized in the 1980s that there was a lot of good stuff that hadn't been published. This is 40 years <laughs> after it's discovered. This is 40 years after its discovery. Now, before we jump to to condemn the people who had been hoarding it, as people said. You see, they, the team consisted of, I think, seven people at most. They would go back after they worked on the scrolls full time for a couple of years. At that stage, it was a matter of putting the pieces together, quite literally. And they had more or less done that by about 1958, when their funding from Rockefeller ran out. Mm. And then they all went off to take jobs. Uh, Frank Cross went to Harvard, John Strugnell, who was my own teacher, went first to Duke and then to Harvard. And, you know, they were teaching other things and new things came up and so forth. Then they'd go back to Jerusalem in the summer. And if you've ever worked in this kind of thing, you would know that it takes you most of the summer to just get back to where you were last year. Right. So it's very difficult, in fact, to make much progress on it. Add to that, they had various problems. Uh, Strugnell and Millick were perfectionists. Certainly, they didn't want to put out stuff that other people might then be able to criticize. Uh, some of them had alcohol problems. Some of them had uh, problems with depression or bipolar. 
conditions. So there were various problems that went into that. But a chorus rose in the 1980s, you know, demanding the release of the scrolls. And, you know, for better or worse, this happened in the early 90s. And in fact, it was for better, I have no, no doubt about that, that then suddenly, because in the 1980s, actually, when Strunkman was put in charge of the operation, he tried to facilitate it by giving some text to his students to publish or and then bringing in a select number of outsiders, including some Israeli scholars. This is when more Jews actually got in, involved. In the 1980s. But this uh, had a very ambiguous effect because there were other scholars who had felt excluded all those years. The man who was a colleague of mine in Chicago, Norman Golb, Jewish scholar who had never been allowed to work on the, the scrolls. Well, now he found that young people writing their dissertations at Harvard could work on scrolls that he didn't have access to. Yeah. And this just infuriated him all the more. And so things got nasty for a while. Now, normally we're a fairly civilized community of urbane people who get along nicely with each other. But that broke down in some quarters in the early 1990s. And there was quite a bit of vitriol around. Uh, no, Strugnell was the, the, the target of a lot of it. And he had a breakdown in the early 90s. And I thought the, um, the reaction of some scholars to that was probably the ugliest thing I witnessed. Like he had some sort of mental break or something? He did, yeah. You know, he, he was bipolar. And uh, he had a breakdown. And people talked about it in, in publications? Yes, or? in the book, too. Because uh, he had to, he was put on medical leave from, uh, from Harvard. Mm. Now, what, uh, what triggered this was he gave um, uh, an interview to an Israeli journalist who had, the Israeli journalist, I think, went in with the idea that this man is anti-Semitic. And he goaded him and Strugnell, who was quite probably drunk at the time, fell for the bait mm. and said or was reported to say that Judaism is a horrible religion that ought not to exist. Now, this is not good copy. No. <laughs> he published this in a paper in Jerusalem, and reasonably enough, people say, why on earth is this man in charge of publishing the Dead Sea Scrolls? And in truth, you know, he was not in any condition to be publishing the Dead Sea Scrolls at the time, and, and he was removed from it. Most of those of us who know, knew the man well, including several Jewish scholars, did not see him as anti-Semitic. You know, he was an old-fashioned Oxonian who think things are either right or wrong. Mm -hmm. Christian if Christianity is right, Judaism is wrong. There are millions of people out there who think that way, but who would never put it the way it was put in this interview. And he wouldn't have done it, I think, if he had been in his right mind. Right. But, but uh, he had been always very helpful, actually, to, well, at least to some Jewish scholars. Uh, but I think... When it came to whether he was going to be helpful to somebody, he didn't care whether they were Jewish or Christian. It was other matters that, that caused him to prefer some people to others. But that, I would say, was the, probably the, the ugliest episode, because then, you know, some people really uh, went over the top in denouncing him. Yeah. From his uh, time of removal, then, who, who has come to head up research on the scrolls? Uh, the man who eventually took it over was an Israeli scholar named Emmanuel Tove, Dutch-born, a remarkable, level-headed, calm person <laughs> who really did a wonderful job. There, there, there were a couple of other scholars heavily involved in it, Eugene Ulrich from Notre Dame and Emile Puesh, but it was really Tove who organized the operation. And, you know, then pretty much everything got published in a little more than 10 years which was a, an amazing achievement, I think. Where are all the women in Dead Sea Scrolls studies? Are, are there any there, women that have been? There, there were a lot more of them now than there were before that. Actually, again, Strugnell was the first to bring women into the operation uh, with the, a Jewish scholar named Devora DeMont and then a number of the students who were given scrolls in the 1980s 
by Strugnall and Frank Cross were women. Uh, Eileen Schuler in Canada has become very prominent. Uh, and then, you know, in the next generation, there are, you don't stop to think whether somebody is male or female. Basically, you know, that there are plenty of both. Right. So there have been several efforts also, I think, over the past two decades to make the Dead Sea Scrolls available in digital form. Uh, one yeah. is the Dead Sea Scrolls Electronic Library uh, that is produced was produced by the Maxwell Institute here and published by Brill. Uh, another is the Israel Museum's online digital Dead Sea Scrolls project with the help of Google Cultural Institute. What is the impact of these types of digitizing projects on the life of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Uh, well, you know, it's wonderful because nowadays, if you want to check a text, you can do it online. You don't have to buy a ticket and go to Jerusalem and squint through a mic, the fine glass and not be able to see anything anyway at the end of it, which is how it was until mm. until relatively recently. So I think it's a wonderful development. Uh, has it transformed the work that's being done? Maybe not necessarily because by now most of the stuff is pretty well published and you can, if you're working on it, you're likely to have the books and, you know, you can do that anyway. But it's certainly a positive development. How about for students? It seems like this is a way to sort of further democratize research on the scrolls and put, yeah. make them even more accessible. It is indeed, and indeed you can now bring it into the classroom. You know, so everybody doesn't need to own a copy of the discoveries of the, in the Judean desert. Uh, you can get these things online and you can put up pictures of manuscripts and discuss the actual scribal techniques. Uh, that's all wonderful. So you talked briefly uh, a moment ago about avenues for future research for Jewish scholars. What do you see as um, some of the future research ambitions of Christian scholars and and scholars, just regular scholars who don't necessarily affiliate with any religious tradition? Uh, you know, I think uh, there is still an awful lot of material that hasn't been properly been assimilated by New Testament scholars. But there is a lot still in the New Testament that can be illuminated from the Dead Sea Scrolls. A lot of New Testament scholars have been more versed in the Greek world than in the Jewish world. So I mean, there's certainly been a lot of progress in that, and a lot has been done, but there is a lot more that can be done. Ultimately, I would hope that we'd get to the point of studying you know, religious communities and their significance from an interdisciplinary uh, perspective. I, there's been... There have been a few interesting ventures in the sociology of sectarianism, but I think there's a lot more that can be done about that. Uh, there is a lot more that can be done with the mysticism of the scrolls by taking the scrolls, you know, as a test case of a broader phenomenon that you will also find in other cultures. And uh, I think, you know, the more we do of that, then that the more the old question of are they Jewish or are they Christian uh, becomes irrelevant. Hmm. It's, a, it's a common pool that they were coming out of. What have your studies of the Dead Sea Scrolls meant for you personally, perhaps uh, with regard to your religious reflection? I know you have a Catholic background or on your thoughts on the human condition in general or in your academic life. Just what have the scrolls done hmm. for you personally? Well, you know, I would see them very much as one test case among others. Uh, I'm not sure that I've learned much from the scrolls that I wouldn't have learned from other Jewish literature of the time. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it does fill in a lot of details. Uh, the the kind of the view of the world, I mean, I'm still more impressed with the apocalyptic side of the scrolls. And that is, you know, a view of this world as a very transient place where you're trying to construct what Peter Berger called a sacred canopy, you know, a structure of meaning to get you through it. And this is what I think they were doing. Now, of course, the more test cases you study, the more you realize that nobody is giving you factual answers, that what you're dealing with are symbolic constructs of people trying to make sense out of life. And they do this with whatever resources are available to them in their own tradition. And that's what these people were doing too. 
Thank you for that. Last question. You've you've been a prolific author. You've written a lot of articles and books. What kind of things are you working on right now? Well, the big project that I'm working on, and I hope people can expect it eventually, is the, the role of the Torah in the formation of Judaism in the Second Temple period. Going back to the time when they first come back from Babylon, because as far as I can see, initially, they didn't have a Torah at all. You don't read about that in the, the prophets of the period right after the Restoration. Now, I would still think it existed by then, but it hadn't yet come to that kind of, of prominence. In the biblical tradition, it's Ezra is credited with that. Uh, Ezra is a shadowy enough figure, but he does seem, or at least somebody in the Persian period seems to have said, this is the official statement of our way of life. Now, for a long time, what that means is uh, there are certain things in it, like you keep the Sabbath, you get circumcised, you go to the temple, you keep the festivals, and you can pretty much reduce the Torah to that. It doesn't mean you read all the details. Then in the time of the Maccabees, there was an attempt to abolish that. And there was a reaction against that. And I think the Essenes and the Pharisees, actually, are part of that reaction, where they say, if some people are trying to prevent us from doing this, we've got to be sure to do it all in every detail, and we should be reading every jot and, jot and tittle. And so you have a huge change, I think, in the way the Torah was used in that period. But, you know, that still never settles it on its own, because as, for example, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, you still then have to have another structure of meaning to say why you should read it your way. And that's where the apocalyptic side of things comes in. So that even as people say it all depends on how you're interpreting the details of the Torah, they will say, but you really need a higher revelation or you need an allegorical method or you need something else. The Torah in itself is never going to do it on its own. So that's what I'm working on. <laughs> Sounds like a big project. Is it uh, multiple books, a single book? What kind? No, it's the one book. Just the one. Okay. One book. Right now, it's it's a, a series of articles. Good. That's uh, Dr. John Collins. He's the author of the Dead Sea Scrolls, a biography from Princeton University Press's Lives of Great Religious Book series. He's the Holmes Professor of Old Testament Criticism and Interpretation at Yale University. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.